a year on from the disappearance of Malaysia Airlines flight MH370 and the aviation world is still scratching its head. A report out overnight has failed to shed any more light on what could have happened. So let's take a look at events leading up to when the plane vanished. The Boeing 777-200 with 227 passengers and 12 crew on board leaves KL for a flight to Beijing. A pilot farewells Malaysian air traffic control, the last words heard from the plane before it fell from the radar. Malaysia's Prime Minister announces the airliner diverted off course, flying for up to six hours after dropping contact. A vast area of the Indian Ocean is included in the search. An American black box detector begins a search for pings generated by the submerged wreck of the plane. A countdown is triggered as battery life fades. Officials leading the search say it could take more than two years to find the plane and 60 million is set aside to fund a continued search. Malaysia announces all on board the missing flight are presumed dead, the disappearance, an accident. And then a major report of the accident released a year after the plane's disappearance today. Well, it reveals very little. It finds no evidence pilots hijacked the plane. So to take stock of where we're at, where we're at now, let's cross to Los Angeles and speak to CNN aviation commentator Richard Quest. Richard, good morning to you. Thanks for coming on to our show. Let's start off about talking about this report. It must be so very frustrating for the families to see no real new information coming to light here. Well, this is the report, and it runs to, oh, I don't know, 109 pages, and then it has another three or four hundred pages of transcripts from air traffic control. But the reality is, as you were just correctly saying, there's nothing in it that tell us, tells us what happens. Mm -hmm. You've really got to sift through. I mean, what they've done is they've ladled everything into it. They've told us about crew training. They've told us, uh, you name it. There's a lot of irrelevant stuff in here that, that doesn't need to be here. But if we sift for the nuggets, what we do find, for instance, on the question of Captain Zahari Shah, uh, people had said he was unstable, he mm. was having marital difficulties. It says, the captain's ability to handle stress at work and home was good. There was no known history of apathy, anxiety, irritability or family stresses. So it, it, there's no evidence, there's no smoking gun alley, there's none of, uh, of, of a pilot who was distressed depressed and determined to suicide. And let's stay on that note though because it said the same thing about the co-pilot and any of the crew, all the crew on board, no suspect behaviour whatsoever, yet at the same time don't investigators stand by the fact that the transmission equipment was manually switched off. So how do those two things marry up? No, they don't. Uh, well, the, the, yes, the, yes. The, the, what they do is this report goes into it. Basically, says the main systems, the ACAR system, that's the digital way in which it communicates, the transponders. It says they stopped working, mm -hmm. but this report does not use the phrase that the Prime Minister of Malaysia used when he said it was deliberate. So in many ways what this report does is row back on many of the things that we have taken. They're still there but they, they're not as definitive as they had been. What I think this report does do is paint a very poor picture of air traffic control in Southeast Asia on the night. Between Singapore, between Malaysia, between Vietnam, all the countries, many of whom saw on their radar what was happening with the plane and the turnaround. And crucially, hours, and I mean hours went by before the alarm was raised. That, to me, remains the scandal of the night. So if that is the strongest criticism, the communication between different countries, and not only that, but the relationship between commercial airlines and the military, has anything changed? I mean, are there any recommendations that the whole system should be overhauled? Another surprise in the report. When we got the preliminary report within 30 days or 40 days uh, last year, that did have a recommendation in it uh, that there should be better tracking and that mm -hmm. needed to be looked at. This report has no recommendations in it that I can see. And that is a surprise. Bearing in mind this level of, have you seen the plane? No, I haven't seen the plane. Have you seen the plane? No, I haven't seen the plane. Where's the plane? Have you seen? This goes on for hours. Mm. Now look, it would not have made a difference. What was happening in the cockpit was going to happen regardless. But what it would have done 
it's perhaps got everybody seeing and looking at that plane and then you'd have followed it then you'd have seen where it was going and we certainly wouldn't be in this situation now of having really mm. frankly only a very sketchy idea where in the Indian Ocean it rests and they're only what some 40 percent through through the search area that they intend to cover let's go yeah. back to the report though um, it, it pointed out one of the major criticism within the screeds and screeds of the 580 odd pages was that the battery of the local Beacon, one of the two, had had run out. What some year, a whole year before the plane even took off. Surely something like that is a basic in the checks that you would do before the plane even takes off. Well, it's not as straightforward as that. The paperwork shows that the battery had expired. But if you read carefully, what mm -hmm. the report says is, if you look at the computer system that was handling it, actually, they say, the, ba the airline says, the battery was replaced, but the computer failed to acknowledge the new installation. So we don't know, the, the report, apparently the, apparently the investigator couldn't accept that because the paperwork has to rule supreme. But the paperwork does show it wasn't replaced. The airline says, oh no, it was definitely replaced. I see. OK, so two sides to that story. Let's talk about the search, though. They are 40% yep. of, of the way through. They are talking about just how difficult the terrain is, very mountainous at the bottom of the ocean. How much hope do you think should be held out? I know the Malaysian Prime Minister says that, that there's still much hope and they're still looking at you know, several more months of searching. How realistic do you think that is? Oh, I think they're going to have to see this one through. They're certainly going to have to see the primary search area. The Malaysian Transport Minister uh, has said that they, you know, that they, he expects to find the plane. But mm. the issue is, look, the Australian Deputy Prime Minister Warren Truss and even Tony Abbott have both put on the table the proposition that you can't keep searching forever. No. You can't. There's going to have to be a review. One has to say, though, Ali, they, they've spent, say, 100 million on it, or 70, 60, 70 million on it. But this plane cost 230 odd million. <laughs> so we're not even at the cost of one aircraft. A, a, a mo everyone's going on about the cost. I don't think it's the cost as much as whether it's a fruitful search. Are, if you move away from the primary area, are you now, in pardon the pun, such deep water, literally and figuratively, that you're just wasting your time doing it? But I don't think they're going to be able to stop for some time yet. Air France 447 showed us you have to keep searching for at least a couple of years. Indeed, and certainly the families of all the victims that were on the plane are keeping that pressure up at the same time. Richard Cuesta from CNN, we very much appreciate your time on this this morning.